The Odyssey for Children by Alfred Church The Cyclops A great many years ago, there was a very famous siege of a city called Troy. The eldest son of the king who reigned in this city carried off the wife of one of the Greek kings, and with her a great quantity of gold and silver. She was the most beautiful woman in the world, and all the princes of Greece had come to her father's court, wishing to marry her. Her father had made them all swear that if anyone could steal her away from the man whom she would choose for her husband, they would help him to get her back. This promise they had now to keep. So they all went to besiege Troy, each taking a number of his subjects with him. On the other hand, the Trojans were helped by many of the nations that lived near them. The siege lasted for a long time, but in the tenth year the city was taken. Then the Greeks began to think about going home. The story that you are now going to hear is about one of these Greek princes, Odysseus by name, who was the king of Ichita. This is an island on the west coast of Greece, and you can find it now marked on the map. Odysseus was, according to one story, very unwilling to go. He had married, you see, a very good and beautiful wife, and they had a little son. So he pretended to be mad and took a plough down to the seashore and began to plough the sand. But someone took his little son and laid him in front of the plough and when Odysseus stopped lest he should hurt him, people said, This man is not really mad. So he had to go. And this is the story of how, at last, he came back. When Troy had been taken, Odysseus and his men set sail for his home, the island of Ichuka. He had twelve ships with him and fifty men or thereabouts in each ship. The first place they came to was a city called Ismarus. This they took and plundered. Odysseus said to his men, Let us sail away with what we've got. They would not listen to him, but sat on the seashore and feasted, for they had found plenty of wine in the city, and many sheep and oxen in the fields around it. Meanwhile, the people who had escaped out of the city and fetched their countrymen, who dwelt in the mountains, and brought an army to fight with the Greeks. The battle began early in the morning of the next day and lasted nearly until sunset. At first the Greeks had the better of it. But in the afternoon the people of the country prevailed and drove them to their ships. Very glad they were to get away, but when they came to the count they found they had lost six men out of each ship. After this, a great storm fell upon the ships and carried them far to the south, past the very island to which they were bound. It was very hard on Odysseus. He was close to his home if he could only have stopped. But he could not. And though he saw it again soon after, it was ten years before he reached it, having gone through many adventures in the meantime. The first of these was in a country of the Cyclops, or round-eyed people. Late, on a certain day, Odysseus came with his ships to an island and found in it a beautiful harbour with a stream falling into it and a flat beach on which to draw up the ships. That night he and his men slept by the ships and the next day they made a great feast. The island was full of wild goats. These the men hunted and killed using their spears and bows. They'd been on the shipboard for many days and they'd had but little food. Now they have plenty. Eight goats to each ship and nine for the ship of Odysseus. 
because he was the chief. So they ate till they were satisfied and drank wine which they had carried away from Ismarus. Now there was another island about a mile away and they could see that it was larger and it seemed as if there might be people living in it. The island where they were was not inhabited. So on the second morning Odysseus said to his men, Stay here my dear friends, I with my own ship and my own company will go to yonder island and find out who dwells there whether they are good people or no. So he and his men took their ship and rowed over to the other island. Then Odysseus took twelve men, the bravest there were in the ship, and they went to search out the country. He took with him a goat skin of wine, very strong and sweet, which the priests of Apollo at Ismarus had given him for saving him and his house and family. When the city was taken, there never was a more precious wine. One measure of it could be mixed with twenty measures of water, and the smell of it was wondrously sweet. Also, he took with him some parched corn, for he felt in his heart that he might need some food. After a while, they came to a cave, which seemed to be a dwelling of some rich and skilful shepherd. Inside there were pens for young sheep and young goats and baskets full of cheeses and milk pans ranged against the walls. Then Odysseus' men said to him, Let us go away before the master comes back. We can take some of the cheeses and some of the kids and lambs. But Odysseus would not listen to them. He wanted to see what kind of man the shepherd might be, and he hoped to get something from him. That evening the Cyclops, the round eye, came home. He was a great giant, with one big eye in the middle of his forehead, and an eyebrow above it. He bore on his shoulder a huge bundle of pine logs for the fire. This he threw down outside the cave with a great crash and drove the flocks inside and then closed up the mouth with a big rock so big that twenty wagons could not carry it. After this he milked the ewes and the she-goats. Half the milk he curdled for cheese and half he set aside for his own supper. This done, he threw some logs on the fire, which he burnt up with a great flame, showing the Greeks, who had fled into the depths of the cave, and then saw the giants come in. Who are you? said the giant. Traders or pirates? We are no pirates, mighty sir, said Odysseus, but Greeks sailing home from Troy. We have been fighting for Agamemnon. The great king, whose fame is spread abroad from one end of the heaven to the other. And we beg you to show hospitality to us, for the gods love those who are hospitable. Nay, said the giant, talk not to me about the gods. We care not for them, for we are better and stronger than they. But tell me, where have you left your ship? But Odysseus saw what he was thinking of when he asked about the ship, namely that he meant to break it up so that as to leave them no hope of getting away. So he said, Oh, sir, we have no ship. That which we had was driven by the wind upon a rock and broken, and we whom you see here are all that escaped from the wreck. The giant said nothing but without much ado, caught up two of the men, as a man might catch up two puppies, and dashed them on the ground and tore them limb from limb and devoured them with huge draughts of milk between, leaving not a morsel, not even the bones. And when he'd filled himself with this horrible food of the milk of the flocks, he lay down among his sheep and slept. Then Odysseus thought, Shall I slay this monster as he sleeps? For I do not doubt that with my good sword I can pierce him in the heart. 
but no. If I do this, then shall I and my comrades here perish miserably. For who shall be able to roll away the great rock that is laid against the mouth of the cave? So he waited till the morning, very sad at heart. And when the giant awoke, he milked his flocks, and afterwards seized two more of the men, and ate them as before. This done, he went forth to the pastures, his flocks following him. But first he put the rock on the mouth of the cave, just as a man shuts down the lid of his quiver. All day Odysseus thought how he might save himself and his companions, and the end of his thinking was this. There was a great pole in the cave, the trunk of an olive tree, green wood, which the giant was going to use as a staff for walking, when he could have dried by the smoke. Odysseus cut off this piece some six feet long, and his companions hardened it in the fire, and hid it away. In the evening the giant came back and did as before, seizing two of the prisoners and eating them. When he'd finished his meal, Odysseus came to him with a skin of wine in his hand and said, Drink, Cyclops, now that you have supped, drink this wine and see what good things we had in our ship. But no one will bring the like to you in your island here, if you are so cruel to strangers. The Cyclops took the skin and drank and was mightily pleased with the wine. Give me more, he said, and tell me your name. I will give you a gift such as a host should. Truly, this is a fine drink, like I have it, to that which the gods hear in heaven. Then Odysseus said, My name is No Man, and now give me your gift. And the giant said, My gift is this, you shall be eaten last. And as he said this, he fell back in a drunken sleep. Then Odysseus said to his companions, Be brave, my friends, for the time is come for us to be delivered from this prison. So they put the stake into the fire and kept it there till it was ready, green as it was, burst into flame. Then they thrust it into his eye, for, as has been told, he had but one. And Odysseus leant with all his force upon the stake and turned it about just as a man turns a drill about when he makes a hole in the ship timber and the wood hissed in his eye as the red hot iron hisses in the water when a smith would temper it to make a sword. Then the giant leapt up and tore away the stake and cried out so loudly that the round-eyed people on the island came to see what had happened. What ails you, they asked, what, that you make such a great uproar, waking us all out of our sleep? Is anyone stealing your sheep or seeking to hurt you? And the giant bellowed, No man is hurting me! Well, said the round-eyed people, if no man is hurting you, then it must be the gods that do it, and we cannot help you against them. But Odysseus laughed when he thought how he had begrudged beguiled them by his name but he was still in doubt how he and his companions could escape for the giant sat in the mouth of the cave and felt to see whether the men were trying to get out among the sheep and Odysseus after long thinking made a plan by which he and his companions might escape by great good luck the giant had driven the rams into the cave for he commonly left them outside these rams were very big and strong, and Odysseus took six of the biggest and tied six men that were left out of the twelve underneath their bellies with azia twigs. And on each side of the six rams to which a man was tied, he put another ram, so that he himself was left, for there was no one who could do the same for him. Yet this also he managed. There was a very big ram, much bigger than the others, and to this he clung, grasping the fleece with both his hands. So when the morning came, the flocks went out of the cave as they were wont, and the giant felt them as they passed by, but he did not perceive the men. And when he felt the biggest ram, he said, How is this? You are not used to lag behind. You are always the first to run to the pasture in the morning and to come back to the fold at night. 
perhaps you are troubled about thy master's eye, which this villain no man has destroyed. First he overcame me with wine, and then he put out my eye. Oh, that you would speak and tell me where he is. I would dash out his brains on the ground. And then he let the big ram go. When they were out of the giant's reach, Odysseus let go his hold on the ram and loosened his companions. They all made as much haste as they could to get to the place where they had left their ship. Looking back to see whether the giant was following them, the crew at the ship were very glad to see them, but wondered that there should only be six. Odysseus made signs to them to say nothing, for he was afraid that the giants might know where they were if they heard their voices. So they all got on board and rowed with all their might, and when they were a hundred yards from the shore, Odysseus stood up in the ship and shouted, You are an evil beast, Cyclops, to devour strangers in your cave, and are rightly served in losing your eye. May the gods make you suffer worse things than this. The Cyclops then heard Odysseus speak, broke off the top of a rock and threw it to the place from which the voice seemed to come. The rock fell just in front of the ship and the wave which made it washed it back to shore. But Odysseus caught up the long pole and pushed the ship off and he nodded with his head being afraid to speak to his companions to row with all their might. So they rowed and when they were twice as far away as before, Odysseus stood up again in the ship as if he was going to speak again, and his comrades begged him to be silent. Do not make the giant angry, they said. We were almost lost just now when the wave washed us back to shore. The monster froze a mighty bolt and froze it far. But Odysseus would not listen but, and cried out, Here, Cyclops, if any man asks you who put out your eye, say it was Odysseus of Ichaca. Then the giant took up another great rock and threw it. This time it almost touched the end of the rudder, but missed by a hand's breath. Therefore the wave helped them on. So big was it that it carried the ship to the other shore. Now Odysseus had not forgotten to carry off sheep from the island for his companions, and these he divided among the crews of the ships. The great ram he had for his own share, so that day the whole company feasted, and they laid down on the seashore and slept. <laughs>